unfinished business from session two. It was not possible for me to put all the components together in an hour and a half. So without your permission, <laughs> I decided to take out a certain part of it and relocate it into session three. And I hope that you would approve of my decision. Wound them. You will wound wound people. The context is clearly in favor of the second reading rather than the first. Number six, that the sun would rise from the west. In the Quran, Ibrahim alayhi salam is having a confrontation with a ruler. And the ruler says, why should I worship your Lord? And Ibrahim alayhi salam says, my Lord gives life and takes life. So the ruler said, but so do I, so do I, <laughs> meaning I can give the order and you, your life will be taken and I can spare you so I can give life and I can take life. To which Ibrahim Islam responded, he said, but well, my Lord causes the sun to rise from the east. Why don't you cause it to rise from the west? My Lord causes the sun to rise from the east. If you are truthful, why don't you cause it to rise from the west? So the true sunrise is a sunrise from the east. And a false sunrise would be a sunrise from the west. But Allah also says in the Quran, La tabdila li khalkillah, that there is no change in Allah's creation. And so we get the scientific principle of the uniformity of nature. Hmm? Hadith says that the sun will rise from the east, I mean from the west. And now we are inundated. The emails keep coming regularly about some gravitational change in the polar structure of the world and scientific terms, Imran Hussein doesn't understand. And they've been coming after me, struggling and struggling and struggling. I don't know who is paying them to do it, to convince me that the sun is actually going to rise from the west, literally. And that's what the hadith says, it's going to rise from the west, literally. And my response is, if that's your belief, well, so be it. I'm afraid I don't agree with you. Would you kindly allow me to hold on to the Quran? The Quran tells me, and my eyes also tell me, that the sun rises from the east. And the Quran tells me that Allah's creation does not change. No. Except that there will come a day when this entire uni material universe is going to be subjected to something called tabdil. And it will be transformed into something which will be غير الأرض والسماوات. So I'm not talking about that event when the earth is going to pitch out of its bosom all of its burdens and the earth is going to speak on that day. We're talking about prevent, previous to that event. The sun is going to rise from the east in accordance with the Quran, not from the west. And so I understand it to be symbolic language. 
not to be literally understood. But you don't have to accept my view. No. However, it'll be so nice of you if you respect me. Respect me to allow me to hold a view I want to hold and don't push it down my throat. I don't do that to you, do I? So you don't do it to me. So number six, that the sun would rise from the west. And I understand that to be that the world is going to experience what is in fact a false sunrise. A new world order coming into being which will be exactly opposite the one that Allah created. Exactly opposite in everything to what Allah has ordained. And I say that world has already come into being. Yes. It's modern Western civilization which today has taken control of the world. But you don't have to accept my view and let's not argue over it. Number seven, eight, and nine. Three khusuf, plural of khas. Three earthquakes. But these are not just earthquakes. These are movements of the earth which will cause a sinking of the earth. And the earth will swallow what it swallows. One in the east, one in the west, and the third one in Arabia. And number 10, that a fire will come out of Yemen. We have anyone from Yemen? No one from Yemen? Okay. A fire will come out of Yemen and will drive people to their place of assembly, of hasha, for judgment. These are the ten known as the major signs. And in these ten major signs you find major actors of Akhiru Zaman and major events of Akhiru Zaman. We want to focus now for a while on Gog and Magog. Why? وَحَرَامٌ عَلَى قَرْيَةٍ أَهْلَكْنَاهَا أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ حَتَّى إِذَا فُتِحَتْ يَأْجُوجُ وَمَأْجُوجُ وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِرُونَ Surah Al- Come on somebody, help me. Anbiya. Surah Al-Anbiya. Hmm? Surah number 21. Allah speaks of a town which he has destroyed. The people of the town have been exiled, sent out. And he's placed a ban on them. They could never return to reclaim that town as their own. Until Gog and Magog have been released. Futihat. Open. And uh, they spread out in all directions or they come down from every height. Using our methodology, and this is the book in which I have done it, the Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world, and my wife has just informed me that we're running out of some copies, but never mind, give your name, and we'll try to get the books to you, inshallah, if we run out of copies. Um, <coughs> When Gog and Magog are released and they descend from every height or they spread out in all directions, then you'll find these people returning to this town to reclaim it as their own. And using our methodology, we came to the conclusion that the town is Jerusalem. And therefore, when you see Banu Israel being brought back to the Holy Land, to reclaim it as their own, which they have done today. Then there must be an explanation for that. And this is our explanation. The Quran says about itself in Surah to Nahl, Surah number 16, 
It says, بَعْدَ أُوذِ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ تِبِيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةً وَبُشْرًا لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ And we have sent down this book, the Qur'an. With an explanation in it for all things. Tibiyanan likulli shay. This is a book which explains all things. It doesn't tell you how to fry fish. Because you don't need that guidance from Allah. But all those things wherein you need guidance from Allah, Allah provides the answers. Banu Israel were driven out of the Holy Land 2,000 years ago, Amar. And for 2,000 years they lived in exile. Today, after 2,000 years, they have returned to the Holy Land and reclaimed it as their own. And today I ask, as I have asked again and again the scholars of Islam, I even mention, I don't normally call people by their names. But I even mention the name of Dr. Yusuf Karadawi in a public lecture to send a message. Please, is this happening by accident? Is it by accident that they have returned to the Holy Land after 2,000 years? To reclaim the Holy Land as their own? Is it by accident that they have restored the state of Israel in the Holy Land? Are these things happening by accident? Or is there an explanation? And if there is an explanation, tell us what it is. But they won't answer me. They won't answer me. And so when you see Banu Israel being brought back to the Holy Land, it is this, these two ayat of Surah Al-Anbiya which explain that it is Gog and Magog who have brought them back. And so Gog and Magog control power in the world. This is my explanation that I have found in the Quran. What is yours? No matter what I do, no matter how softly I speak, no matter how loudly I shout, they will not answer me. This is the world of Islamic scholarship today. It's a pity. They will not answer me. But time is running out for them. Events are unfolding. And so now we turn to the study of Gog and Magog. And we don't have time today to do an exhaustive study, but we turn to Surah Al-Kaf of the Quran. Number 20. That's right. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ ذِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ قُلْ سَأَتْلُوا عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْهُ ذِكَرًا The rabbis were in Medina and the Quraysh sent a delegation to find out from them how can we tell whether this man Nabi Muhammad is indeed a prophet. The rabbis had asked him three questions which only a prophet can answer. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending the answers to the three questions. One of the questions was, ask him about the great traveler. Ask him about the great traveler who traveled to the two ends of the world. The second question was, ask him about the ruh. The third question, ask him about the young man of all who had a strange story in a cave. In answering the questions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
repeats the question and then gives the answer. And so you see how it begins. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ ذِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ Question two. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ الْرُوحِ And they question thee about the ruh, the soul. But question three, no, no repetition of the question. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ No, no, no. Why not? Everything that happens in the Quran happens for a particular purpose. And for those who are observant and who think and ponder, there are lessons to be learned. So with question one, ask him about the great traveler who traveled to the two ends of the earth. And we are told that this traveler is called Zulkarnain, the one who possesses two Karns. And Karn can mean a horn, so Karnain will be two horns. And Karn could also be an age or an epoch, a time. So Karnain will be two ages. So this is a man who is either of two horns or impacts upon two ages. Kulsuatlu alaykum minhu zikra. I am going to tell you something about him which must be remembered. Inna makkanna lahu. Next one. Okay. Yeah, that's one. Inna makkanna lahu fil ardi wa ataynahu min kulli shayin sababa. Behold, we established him on earth securely with the power and with the means, with the capacity and the knowledge and the right means to achieve anything that he might set out to achieve. And so surely a superpower, not an ordinary power, a superpower. فَأَتْبَعَ sababa. And so he chose the right means now to do what he wanted to do. Verse number 85. No, back to 85. Okay, now 86. Curry. Hatta iza balaga maghrib shams. He sets out on a journey to the west. And uh, he reaches a place where the sun is setting. And there he found it setting in a body of water that was hamia, dark murky so visibility in that water will be very shallow and there he came across a people and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now wants to teach a lesson Zulkarnain possesses power to do whatever he wants to do but Zulkarnain also has faith in Allah. When power rests on the foundations of faith, how will power be used? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Zulkarnain, Kulna ya Zulkarnain. You have a choice to use your power either to punish or to reward. Treat them nicely. How are you going to use your power? Next verse. Zulna Karnain then responds and says, Those who are committing acts of wickedness, volum, 
oppression. I will use my power to punish them. And when they return to you, you will also punish them. And so the perpetrators of injustice and oppression and wickedness will be punished both here and there. And so there will be an essential harmony between this world here under and that world above. Okay? But those who are righteous in conduct I'm going to treat them well and reward them and only give them that which is easy for them to fulfill. And so when power rests on the foundations of faith, power will be used to punish the oppressor and power will be used to support and to help and to reward those who have faith and who are righteous in conduct. That is what the world could have been if we had followed the Quran. Hmm? That is what the world could be like if you follow the Quran. Is it possible for us to identify that body of water? If we can, we'll be on the way to locating the geographical location of the area in which we're talking about. We're going to do that in a moment, inshallah. Then Zulkarnain set off on the second journey now. And he's going to the rising of the sun. And when he had traveled to the distance that he could travel, the Quran does not tell us how far it was. He came upon a people. Lam naja'al min duniha sitra. A people... Sometimes the Quran is agonizingly short in expression. Agonizingly. Only four or five words. That's all that you have. Lam naja'al lahum min duniha sitra. We have not provided for them as a covering other than this covering. Covering from what? Who are they? We have to try to penetrate now and give our own understanding. It appears to us that it is the natural covering that you have from the sunshine. So a people living a primitive way of life. A people living a primitive way of life. When power rests on the foundations of faith, how will power be used when it confronts a people living a primitive way of life? Will they also have human rights, primitive peoples? Or do they have less than rights that others have? Suppose you have a whole basin of oil underneath there. And this oil company has located and discovered this huge basin of oil, billions of barrels of oil underneath there. But above, it's the primitive people living this primitive way of life. Which takes priority? The rights of exploitation of the oil or the rights of the people? to live on this step. The false sunrise says the oil is more important. So take the people and ship them to Siberia. <laughs> people are not important. You can dispense with their rights. Power is used to exploit the resources of the earth for our benefit. But not Zulkarnain. Catholic. Catholic. Even it's only one word? That's all. 
One word كذلك وقد أحطنا بما لديه خبرة Allah uses one word to respond كذلك وقد أحطنا بما لديه خبرة أنزل كرنين We understood Allah understood why he acted in the way that he did He left them as they were undisturbed indicating that the human rights the human rights of even the most primitive of all people take precedence over Aramco <laughs> the human rights of even the most primitive of all people hmm? and he left them as they were and then he went on to the third journey which is verse number 92 they had asked of only two journeys to the two ends of the earth but Allah knew that they wanted to know whether Nabi Muhammad knew about the third journey that's why they only asked about two and Allah is now giving a third answer having given the first and the second he now goes to the actual target of the question which is the third journey and it is on the third journey that you come to one of the major signs of Akhiru Zaman which was the target of the question they wanted to know whether Nabi Muhammad knew about Gog and Magog and so now he travels in the third direction he comes to a place between two, a pass between two mountain ranges. On this side are mountains, on this side are mountains. And in between there is a pass. Can we locate geographically where we're talking about? Is it possible? A pass between two mountain ranges. And there he come across he came across a people kaula. He came across a people whose language he could not understand. Because their language was unique. Their language had no connections with other language in that region. It was a language which was not connected with all the other languages in that region. It was a unique language. We're getting clues along the way, important clues for locating. When they had learned to communicate with each other, then these people spoke to Zulkarnain and said to him, Ya Zulkarnain, O Zulkarnain, in the Juja wa Ma'juja Mufsiduna fill up. Gog and Magog are committing acts of fasad in our territory there are many sins that we can commit but only some of them are called crimes a sin you punished up there but a crime you punish here as well and amongst the crimes amongst the criminal acts that we can commit there are gradations of punishment like if you steal cut off your hand but the punishment that is severest of all is the punishment for facade it is not only that which corrupts but also destroys so societies can collapse societies can be destroyed because of facade not just individuals or families and facade comes in many different forms for example uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and their homosexuality 
that's fasad. The corruption of agriculture, that's fasad. Hmm? Many different kinds of fasad described in the Quran. And a good student will want to do some research and write a paper on fasad in the Quran. So Gog and Magog have PhDs in fasad. And so the punishment is the most terrible of all. At the lowest level of punishment is banishment. But at the highest level of punishment, it is cut off the hands and feet on opposite sides and crucify them until death. That's the worst punishment in the Quran. And this is what Gog and Magog do. But in the Hadith, Allah speaks about Gog and Magog and He says, I have created creatures of mine so powerful, Sahih Muslim, that none but I can destroy them. So they have almost an indestructible power. And they use their power exactly opposite to Zulkarnain. He uses his power to punish the oppressor. But they use their power to oppress. He uses his power to reward those who are righteous in conduct and treat them nicely. They use their power to wage war on the believers. He uses his power in such a way that shows respect for human rights. Even the human rights of the aboriginal aborigines of Australia, the human rights of the American Indian tribes who love the earth and respected the sky and the rivers and the sea and the trees and the birds far more than the American people would ever, ever, ever do. How do you treat these people? He respected their human rights and left them as they were, but not Gog and Magog. Today, the American Indians and the Canadian Indians are in prison and they're drinking alcohol and they're wearing blue jeans and eating McDonald's hamburgers. That's where they are today from what they were before. Hmm? <laughs> oh, Zulkarnain, can you help us? You have the power. Can you build a barrier to protect us from these people? He should have said, I don't need to build any barrier. I'll move in there and I'll beat them up. And they won't touch you anymore. Huh? Like if a Muslim woman is walking on the street of Brooklyn, nobody dares to molest her. Oh no, not a Muslim woman. Not in Brooklyn, not in Harlem, not in the Bronx. Go, you make the mistake of molesting a Muslim woman, all the men will be on you like tigers. And they'll teach you a lesson you'll never forget. Hmm? So I don't need to build any barrier, I'll go and teach them a lesson they'll never forget. But no, he didn't say that. They said, we're prepared to pay you. He said, I don't need your money. What Allah has given to me is more valuable. He recognized that even though he had this power, his power was not enough to be able to go and teach them a lesson. So he agreed to build a barrier, recognizing that their power was so great that even he could not defeat them. What I need from you is your labor. Help me with your manpower. And I'm going to build a barrier between you. Now, number 96, verse number 96. Bring me blocks of iron. And so that has to be a geographical location where there's iron ore. It has to be a geographical location where there are mountain ranges and a pass between the mountain ranges. It has to be a geographical location where on the left you have a body of water which is so dark and murky that visibility is very shallow, okay? And it has to be an area where there are large deposits of iron or oh. bring me blocks of iron. 
And after he had covered the pass with blocks of iron, he said, build a furnace, blow with your bellows, and now bring me molten copper. So he poured the molten copper, and the engineers, we have an engineer here, tells me that this is to prevent rust. And after he had built the barrier and covered it, the Quran speaks, it changes from the word saddain to use another word, sadafain. Where is it? In verse number 95, Atuni Zubar al Hadid, Hatta is a sawa bain as sadafain. Previously, the word used was saddain. But now the word used is sadafain. Sada, sadain is two barriers, two mountain ranges. But sadafain is something else. It is like the two sides of a shell. We're going to have some pictures just now. The two sides of a shell, you've been to the seashore. When you open a shell like this, it will join at the bottom, but open at the top. That's the shape of the pass between the mountains. Join at the bottom, open at the top. Hmm? So when he had blocked off this space, this sadafain, now the molten copper is put on it. And then he says, Haza rahmatum mi rabbi. Oh, Gog and Magog could neither scale the barrier nor could they penetrate it. So they are now trapped behind the barrier. And so Zulkarni now says, Hada rahmatum mi rabbi. This barrier is constructed in, in, in consequence of Allah's kindness and grace. For but when that time come of which my word has warned, is a futihat. They will not return to reclaim the town as their as their own until is a futihat, until Gog and Magog are released. When that time comes for Gog and Magog to be released, so that Banu Israel are to be brought back to the Holy Land, Nabikum Lafifa brought back as a motley crowd. At that time, Ja'alahu Dakka, Allah is going to bring down this barrier and it become dust. Would Alexander, the Greek general who worshipped Zeus and Mars and Venus, Venus was a goddess, instead of Allah, would he speak like this? And yet you have so many people saying, Zulkarnain was Alexander, or Zulkarnain was some Zoroastrian who was an emperor of Persia. Hmm? Zulkarnain has to be someone who worships Allah, the one God. When that time comes of which my Lord has warned, he's going to cause this barrier to collapse, to become ruins. And then at that time, وَتَرَكْنَ بَعْدَهُمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ يَمُوجُ فِي Allah will then cause Gog and Magog, it seems, to surge against each other like waves crashing against each other. Or Allah will cause mankind to enter into an age of universal anarchy with people surging against each other, clashing with each other all over the earth. And when you see these things happening on the face of the earth, you know the trumpet is coming. For Jama'ana Hum 
and on that day we shall place hell for all to see. In other words, this world is going to become a living hell. Before the eyes of those who deny the truth. الذين كانت أعينهم في غطاء عن ذكري وكانوا لا يستطيعون السماع. They are those whose eyes have been veiled against any remembrance of Allah. They could not bear to listen to the voice of truth. And then, finally, this verse has to be included in the passage. أفحسب الذين كفروا أن يتخذوا عباد من دوني أولياء إن أعتدنا جهنم للكافرين نزلا do they who reject the truth do they perchance believe that they would succeed in embracing my true servants who worship me to become their awliya their friends and their allies while excluding me and thus the trap, to trap them in the world which would become a living hell. Verily we have read it hell, Jahannam, to welcome all those who deny the truth. This is the passage of the Quran that introduces the subject of Gog and Magog. Now let's turn to the pictures and see whether we can locate. We have a number of pictures for you. I'm going to have to stand up now. Okay. This is the Caucasus Mountains here. The white being the snow. And on the left side there is a body of water which is so dark and so murky with so much algae in it that it has been given a name. And that name has been there with it for many, many, many years. Even the time of Ibn Kathir. It's called the Black Sea. <laughs> it's called the Black Sea. Why? Because it is so dark. If you go to the Mediterranean Sea and you're on a ship, you can see several meters underneath the water. But if you go to the Black Sea, you'd hardly be able to see more than one meter underneath the water. Ibn Kathir recognizes this to be the sea mentioned in the Quran as Hamiya. On this side of the Black Sea is the Caspian Sea. And in between the Caspian and the Black Sea, is this body of land. So we see that Zulkarnain is traveling in that direction to the west and then in this direction to the east. Right, good. Bismillah. Next one. Okay, there we are. That's where the Holy Land is. Israel. And there we are. The Black Sea. The Caspian Sea. And the mountain range. Over here. So, when Gog and Magog are released, says the Hadith, the first of them will pass by the Sea of Galilee. That's where the Sea of Galilee is, north of Jerusalem. The Sea of Galilee is north of Jerusalem. And Gog and Magog are heading for 
Jerusalem. The word Jerusalem does not occur in the, in the Hadith, it's the word Baitul Maqdis. Hmm? So Gog and Magog are going to come down. The word Baitul Maqdis is actually there in the Hadith. Gog and Magog are going to come down to Baitul Maqdis. And in the passage, in the process of going to Baitul Maqdis, they're going to pass by the Sea of Galilee. So they're coming from the north. They're coming from here. All right? So Zulkarnain travels this way and then this way. And in between is the passage. See if you can find that. The passageway between. Here we are. There is the gorge. And there is one side. And there is the other side. And it's like an open shell. See, the Quran is describing this Sadafain. There they are again, the Sadafain. Go ahead. I'm afraid I don't agree with you. Would you kindly allow me to hold on to the Quran? The Quran tells me, and my eyes also tell me, that the sun rises from the east. And the Quran tells me that Allah's creation does not change. No. Except that there will come a day when this entire uni material universe is going to be subjected to something called Tabdil. And it will be transformed into something which will be غير الأرض والسماوات. So I'm not talking about that event. When the earth is going to pitch out of its bosom all of its burdens and the earth is going to speak on that day. We're talking about prevent previous to that event. The sun is going to rise from the east in accordance with the Quran, not from the west. And so I understand it to be symbolic language, not to be literally understood. But you don't have to accept my view. No. Unfinished business from session two. It was not possible for me to put all the components together in an hour and a half. So without your permission, <laughs> I decided to they caught a certain part of it and relocated it to certain three. And I hope that you would approve of my decision. Wound them. You will wound. Wound people. The context is clearly in favor of the second reading rather than the first. Number six. that the sun would rise from the west. In the Quran, Ibrahim alayhi salam is having a confrontation with the sunrise from the west. But Allah also says in the Quran, La tabdila li khalkillah, that there is no change in Allah's creation. And so we get the scientific principle of the uniformity of nature. Hmm? Hadith says that the sun will rise from the east, I mean, from the west. And now we are inundated. The emails keep coming regularly about some gravitational change in the polar structure of the world and scientific terms, Imran Hussein doesn't understand. And they've been coming after me, struggling and struggling and struggling. I don't know who is paying them to do it, to convince me that the sun is actually going to rise from the west, literally. 
And that's what the hadith says, it's going to rise from the West, literally. And my response is, if that's your belief, well, so be it. However, it'll be so nice of you if you respect me. Respect me to allow me to hold a view I want to hold and don't push it down my throat. I don't do that to you, do I? So you don't do it to me. So number six, that the sun would rise from the west. And I understand that to be that the world is going to experience what is in fact a false sunrise. A new world order coming into being which will be exactly opposite the one that Allah created. Exactly opposite in everything to what Allah has ordained. And I say that world has already come into being. Yes. It's modern Western civilization which today has taken control of the world. But you don't have to accept my view and let's not argue over it. Number seven, eight, and nine. Three khusuf, plural of khas. Nation with a ruler. And the ruler says, why should I worship your Lord? And Ibrahim alayhi salam says, my Lord gives life and takes life. So the ruler said, but so do I, so do I. <laughs> Meaning, I can give the order and you, your life will be taken. And I can spare you, so I can give life and I can take life. To which Ibrahim alayhi salam responded and he said, well, my Lord causes the sun to rise from the east. Why don't you cause it to rise from the west? My Lord causes the sun to rise from the east. If you are truthful, why don't you cause it to rise from the west? So the true sunrise is a sunrise from the east. And a false sunrise 